like a well. Lord, we pray tonight that we would draw life and understanding and insight from your word. And it would help us to understand you more and help us to understand the Jewish people and just enliven us, enliven our prayers by what we hear and what we understand. So bless us as we study the scriptures, Lord. We also pray for Fiona and we thank you that um, by your grace, she didn't fall and hurt her anything you know, on a sharp corner or anything. And she's she just said she's waiting for results back from the doctor, just sitting in A&E and we've spoken to her. So um, we just thank you that um, you know the, that wasn't too uh, grave an accident, but we do ask your blessing upon her um, that you protect her and um, help her to rest and uh, to be revitalized, Lord. So we thank you for all these things. Thank you for being with each and every one of us from wherever we've come from as we come tonight to hear from you. So bless our time together in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Oliver. Now, I'm firstly going to wonder whether if I write on this board, you can see it because there are all sorts of potential disasters with writing on a whiteboard in a Zoom meeting in a small space. So tell me if you can see this square. No, not very. Oh, you can. Very good. I'm going to write here. Perfect. World. And I'm going to ask you, uh, ask you what Bible verse, or what section of the Bible would you choose for that? Exactly right, Elizabeth. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2. That is a perfect world. You've got God, people, and very importantly, creation. In, a per in perfect unity. Everything's perfect. Then you've got box 2. Perfection, spoiled. Anyone want to take a wild guess what verse, what uh, chapter of the Bible and uh, verse we're going to go for there, or chapter rather, rather than? Well, that's absolutely right, Maureen Evans. Well done, Genesis three. Everything is ruined, and then there's a whole load of stuff. But I'm going to jump to to the re not rebuilding rebuild of perfection anyone want to hazard a guess where we might think of that colin wilkinson even though you're eating genesis 12 is correct Now, these are gen we're talking in general terms, not like specific stuff. But what I'm trying to say to you is that God chose Abraham, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the line. The, that's where the story rebuilds. And it's important to understand that God isn't bringing a new thing where well, he's bringing a new thing, but he's, he's going to restore things. He's not just going to destroy everything and then and then reintroduce something new. No, even as Jesus rises from the dead, he's being he's restored. He's not something completely different. He still recognizes friends can still see him. They can still touch him. They still know him. And the same is true for creation. OK, jump to. The ultimate restoration. In the Gospels. This is how everything everything is going to point to this how are we going to achieve this ultimate restoration and we know it is with through the perfect sacrifice the perfect sacrifice the perfect resurrection and then his ascension and his promise to return. His promise to return, very important. Um, Jewish people, when I talk about this whole idea of Jesus returning the second time as the Messiah who's going to restore all things, they sometimes say to me, oh, he's like a builder who does half a job and says he's going to come back. 
but that isn't that isn't what we're seeing here what we're seeing here is god's grace and his mercy and his plan unfolding perfectly so uh lastly we've got Re revelation we've got oh sorry i've given you the clue there haven't i perfection permanently restored and again i'm going to say to you with god each other and creation no more covid no more global warning no more uh, no more kind of dominance of facebook and uh, them selling all our data without us even knowing what they're doing everything all that gone perfection restored and not this time a perfection that can break but a perfection that is permanent so i want to say that those revelation 21 and 22 the gospels like i've said genesis 12 those those are like linchpins for the big bible story what theologians what oliver would normally would call the meta narrative so this is the big story of the bible that we had a perfect world where we were made by god in his image male and female made by him everything was perfect we chose to make our own rules and break his and as a consequence everything was spoiled but god didn't give up on us no he actually went after the people that recognized that they were broken, people like Abraham, people like Isaac, people like Jacob, and he worked through their lives to achieve his purposes. Now, this is akin to me trying to get Felix to tidy, my teenager, to tidy his room. You know, we are not the people that we would have chosen for this great project because we are unreliable. But that's the whole point. He chooses the broken and the unreliable in order that glory should go to his name. So uh, perfection, perfect world spoil. We spoilt it. He starts with Abraham. It works through the whole line. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, da, 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 da. And it reaches its pinnacle, its peak as Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect man, the perfect priest, the perfect king. The perfect one makes the perfect ultimate sacrifice and then per perfectly rises from the dead. Reminds people that everything had to happen according to what was written in the scriptures. And then he flies up into heaven like uh, those of you old enough and used to watch this program called Monkey. He used to call a little cloud, monkey, and he'd call a cloud and he'd fly off into the cloud. Jesus literally just flies up into the cloud. It really happened. And he promised, and having promised to return to restore all things. And while he is away, obviously, he, he says, he'll never leave us or forsake us. He gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of seal of, our, of his promise. And our lives, for me, I've spent only 15, 16 years following him. But I've seen how true it is that he is always with us in all circumstances, regardless, and always working everything for the good. So what on earth has all that got to do? Why is it, why, why if you're looking at Leviticus, does that even matter? Well, because Leviticus is at the heart of the Torah. And when I say the Torah, I don't need, mean what my Orthodox friends in Stanford Hill mean by the Torah. When they say Torah, they mean Tanakh, which is the entire Old Testament. Um, what I mean is the five books of Moses. So you've got to pay attention. You've got to pay attention to seams. So uh, this, is, this is a suit that I bought for a wedding. And one of the reasons I bought it is it's got very neat seams. And the seams, the way it's put together, they are really, in some ways, what forms the suit, what forms the jacket. And if a seam, but you, well, you all know, like lots of us know at lockdown, that seams have burst. If they haven't burst in your trousers or your skirt, they've burst in your temper or your some other area of your life, as as this confinement has put pressure on us all. So, we Leviticus is on us is in. You've got five books. 
what I really wanted to do, you know, when you, I couldn't find any scissors, but you know, when you used to do those, you used to cut the little men out and then open them like to make Christmas decorations. Well, that's what I wanted to do, but you're going to have to put up with this. So you've got like man number one. And then, ooh. can you tell I didn't do art at school? Oh, that one's got dodgy arms. Oh, we're going to have to go down here. And then we're going to go over here for the last person here. Woo. He looks a bit like a ghost. That's a bit. So you've got Genesis, Exodus. Oh, I should be asking you, shouldn't I? Genesis, Exodus. What's the next one? Leviticus, that's right. Well done. You can tell you're at Bible College, Oliver. Uh, then what? Then what? Uh, is it Numbers or Deuteronomy? Numbers. Well done, Colin. Numbers and then Deuteronomy. So look who is at the centre. Leviticus. Now, I've read somewhere in the Bible that it says... Uh, that Jesus is the is the is the summation of of the Tanakh, that everything, every promise made, everything is everything, 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 is about Him. And so, if you have a little group of people like this, and the middle one is called Leviticus, wouldn't it be interesting if at the heart of Leviticus was something to do with the gospel? So let's have a little look. Let's have a little look at the book. Let me uh, let me read you. Oh, by the way, Leviticus. Do you know why it's called Leviticus? It's so it it should be called Leviticus. Then you would definitely know. Leviticus. In in Hebrew, it's called Vaikra. It it's the first few words. The Lord called. Uh, but in for us, it's we've always known it as Leviticus. But it's easier to remember what it's about if you think about it as Leviticus, because <laughs> it's about the Levites and how the Levites are to act as priests and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to control the people. And la, 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 la. But it isn't just about the Levites. The people are involved. And in fact, it's the people who have to bring the sacrifices to the priests who have them killed. So but that's just to say. This is how Leviticus starts. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, whenever you bring an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. So it's obviously you've got to bring an animal, but he's not being super specific about what animal at this point. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd. So burnt offerings. Burnt offerings are totally to be totally consumed and totally burnt up, i.e. not shared by the priests or by the people. So it's, it's the, the first offering is a sacrifice that will be totally consumed and it's male. Are you sort of seeing Jesus in this story? Here is a sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed himself wholly, completely hands himself over to death in order that we might have life. So if the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. Oh, well, that rules all of us out anyway, doesn't it? Because uh, I don't know about you, but I know some of the males in this group and I know they're not without defect. Me especially. So you've, you've, you've got the first part of Leviticus introducing the way that an animal must be sacrificed. And you will already know that the focus is on a perfect male that will be totally consumed. Uh, he must bring it uh, to the entrance of the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. Then the Israelite has to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So now we know that the book of Leviticus 
is about this interesting thing called atonement. So atonement is sometimes, sometimes people say uh, atonement, it is at one meant, you know, like it, 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 it's the sense of uh, uh, bringing God and his people back together. But there's more to atonement to that, really. First of all, there's the idea of cap there's the idea of, of wiping clean. Most famously, I suppose you could say Yom Kippur is a, is a time where all everything was wiped clean, wiped clean with the blood of of a perfect male sacrifice. And if we were doing that particular text. I'd be taking you through and showing you how the tabernacle symbolizes creation and how everything uh, and how uh, uh, God is by this perfect sacrifice cleansing all creation and all people. But we're not doing that, so we can't do that. Maybe another time. The next thing is that it's not just wiping clean. It's not just like me wiping the the surface clean in my new kitchen because that I'm so proud of because I've worked so hard to get it so perfect. No, it's not just wiping clean. There's also the paying of a ransom. There's also it's wiping clean and the paying for a, a ransom. And then the third thing in a way there is, and it's slightly different, is there's a covering. There's a covering. So atonement is wiping clean, paying the ransom and covering your sin all at the same time, in order that we might ceremonially restore our perfect relationship with God. So Leviticus turns out to be, to my mind, quite exciting. A male without defect is sacrificed. The priests also must be from a particular line. They have to be chosen, they're, they're unique in a sense, and none more unique than the great high priest, who I've already mentioned, we get this ritual of Yom Kippur with him. And these priests, all of them have got to be without defect. They've got to be masters of discerning what is clean and unclean. And, uh, and I'm sorry to use this, to, I think this is kind of significant, um, they must be reproductively complete. Is that a good way of me saying what I want to say without offending anybody? No one's offended, but you know what I mean. Paul says he wishes he could. When he's talking about circumcision, he he wishes that uh, that the that the that the circumcisers would be emasculated. Well, there's no such thing as an emasculated priest. And in Isaiah, actually, it's very excitingly, uh, it talks about eunuchs. Uh, being priest in the temple in the new creation, which is impossible uh, before the new creation comes. So uh, the priests must be, the, the sacrifice must be male and without defect. The priests have got to be chosen from a particular line and they've got to be perfect. And so can you, can you put together a little picture there of Jesus? The, because he's, he's, he's both sacrifice and priest. He's the perfect sacrifice and he's the perfect priest and he's the perfect man for the job of restoring perfection. Now, you, you may or may have not may or may not have noticed that I keep saying the word perfection all the time. And you thought, hang on a minute, I thought Leviticus was about holiness. And so I want to say to you, what do you think holiness is? That's correct, Linda. Holiness is often described as um, as being dedicated, dead, set apart or dedicated. You know, my pastor used to show a pen. Whoop, let me get it in the middle. And then he'd take the pen lid off and take it away and say, it's like you're taken off and, and, and given another purpose. Well, that again, I'd say is true. But holiness is more than just that. If, and it has to be, because otherwise it would be possible for you just to, um, to sort of go and do stuff and be perfect. 
you know, just be really dedicated and then that would be enough. And that can't be right because the gospel is a gospel of grace. It's, a, it's we are, we're righteous in God's sight by faith, not by works. So is there more to holiness than being dedicated or being set apart or uh, keeping the law or trying to be a good person? Or Because honestly, that can very quickly fall into something called Christian moralism, where, where you compete with your non-Christian friends to be a better moral person uh, than them and that they then see, wow, what a great person you are, Simon. I want to be a Christian too. And then you've misunderstood Christianity. They have and you're in all sorts of trouble. Thankfully, I'm not that good. So I don't have to, I don't try to compete on that front. So I've been lucky in that regard. So holiness is set apart, but it's, it's more than that. It's a sense of wholeness. It's a sense of, com of being complete. It's because Leviticus is about the way in which God's people in the Old Testament, God's Old Testament church, Israel, whatever you want to call that group of people that God gathered from various different areas together, the way that they would, uh, the way that they, they would come together was because they could, they could come into God's presence. And the presence of God is a key theme in Leviticus. And um, he's, pre he's preeminently present in their worship, but he's also present in their, in their really like dull things. Who would think that there would be a whole section on what to do if you get mold on the inside of your walls? It, it seems irrelevant, but it, what it is teaching us is that he's, he's concerned about every aspect of our lives and he's permanently there. He's never absent. You'll see in, uh, you will, sometimes we think of his absence when we're disciplined or where things go wrong, we think he's absent. But you'll see in Leviticus at the back half of the book, uh, following Leviticus 26, which hopefully one day we will get to. Uh, um, when you get to Leviticus 26, you can see it's blessings and curses. He never leaves. He'll never leave you or forsake you. And he, he, he don't, don't ever make them that mistake. So, okay. I told you this story about, so I've told you the story really about the perfect world that was spoiled by us, that God has guaranteed to restore back to perfection. We've seen how Jesus is, is pictured in this, in Leviticus in some ways. And then we know, don't we, that our great hope, our great hope is this new creation. Our, every morning I say these simple words, glory to be, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory be to the Holy Spirit, world without end. Because I need to remind myself every morning that the glory belongs to the Father, Son and Spirit, the Trinitarian God, revealed, Trinity revealed throughout the Old Testament in very precise ways. And then not just that, not just his life, death and resurrection, but this promise of this great world to come. And that always helps me to deal with the fact that whatever goes wrong in the day, however I'm feeling, it helps me to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. So if the story of the Bible is heading towards uh, Revelation 21 and 22, and if Leviticus is a book about the perfect male sacrifice to atone for sin, and if every little sacrifice and every little detail are all little tiny little pictures like fragments in a stained glass window, then I wonder why Simon chose Leviticus 26 as his uh, re-entry into the world after nearly 12 months of furlough, give or take a few months here or there. Um, if you have Bibles in front of you, uh, then feel free to open them if you haven't already um, at uh, Leviticus chapter 26. I'm going to read some of it. So uh, Leviticus chapter 26, um, beginning at verse one, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone yourselves. Do not place a carved stone in your land or bow down before it. I am the Lord, your God. Observe the Sabbaths and have a reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord your God. 
if you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season and the ground will yield its crops and trees, uh, trees the, fruit of their, the field, fruit of the field. Your threshing will continue until the grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until the planting and you will eat all the food uh, you want and live in safety in your land. Now, can you see, so he's saying, if you, if you obey me, if you live perfect lives, you will live in a perfect world. But, but we, know that we, can't, we know that we don't live in a perfect world and we know that we can't live perfect lives. But look what he's saying. I'll send you rain. So rain is the source of life. The rain is all very well and good, but you need food as well. You need food and water, don't you? So the next thing he gives you is food. And then food and water are great. But if you're not safe, you know, if you're constantly frightened, if you're constantly under threat, that's no good. So the next thing he gives you safety. And then the last thing he gives you is a place to live. Now, I don't know if you remember a story in Genesis 2 about God creating a safe place for Adam and Eve to live. But doesn't that sound a bit like that? Let's see if it sounds any more like that. I will grant peace in the land. Shalom. And you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove the savage beast from the land and the sword will not pass you through the country. You will pursue your enemies and they'll fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 before your enemies will fall by the sword before you. And then so this is this is a picture. This is like a, this is a picture of, you know, like a, like a, in Revelation where he says there'll be no sickness, no death, no you know, so it's all the good things and none of the bad things. That's basically what he's saying. And then this is what he says to us. And he says it to this is what he's promising us this evening. And this is what should lift your heart. I will look upon you with favor and I will make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating the last year's harvest when you have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. It's honestly, you know, people always say this is just, Every time I read this passage, it just really encourages me, helps me to understand the character of God. I'll look upon you with favor. Well done, my good and faithful servant, he will say. He'll make us fruitful and increase and multiply. I don't know if you can think of where did we hear that fruitful and multiply thing? Uh, uh, wasn't it in Genesis one and Genesis two? Isn't it hinting at this restoration of the of Eden? You'll still be eating last year's harvest uh, when you have to move it out to make room for the new. Um, revel back again. Like we can go, we can we can go, we can go left or right at this point. Left to uh, back to Genesis or right to the end of Revelation, and you see the new creation being painted out, particularly Genesis uh, Revelation twenty-two, the end. I will put my dwelling place among you. Hold on a minute. What's funny about that? Uh, what's funny about that is he has. He's, he, they're in. The, they're, we're talking about the tabernacle, which is his dwelling place. So it must be something greater than that. Yeah, because it, the, the 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 tabernacle. That's to tabernacle means to dwell. So they've got that they've got the tent of meeting and the tabernacle. They've got two tents where he's where he appears. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. Again, where did he walk amongst his people for the first time in creation? Here, Leviticus is promising us 
a relationship with God exactly like the relationship that Adam and Eve had with their creator. It's astounding. I will not bore you. Again, it's the positive and the negative that favor at the beginning and now he won't bore you or doesn't, he won't reject you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. It, it's relational. He's not a distant God. He's a very personal God who loves his children and wants to be close with them, so close that he, he wants to walk with them. It's just the lovely thing, isn't it? You know, uh, when, you're, when the kids were little, going for a walk, going for a walk with the kids, sometimes it was a t just something you had to do to get them to sleep or tire them out. But occasionally they would actually just want to go for a walk with you. And I used to walk with Felix for miles all over the place. And it was just so delightful. And, and that's, he, if, I, if I, who am a sinner, can love my son in that way, imagine how much God is going to love you. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. For slaves to the Egyptians, read, uh, read John 3, maybe. You know, we were all in the dark. And, and would not want to come into the light, but he brought us out into the light so that what could be seen could be seen to be of God's, God's work. Light's actually a big theme in Leviticus, there's another story as well. So, so that you'd no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bar of your yoke. You know, some of us carry heavy burdens. Some of us talk about them too much. Some of them, some of us don't talk about them at all. But one day that yoke will be broken. You will be completely released. And he will enable you to walk with your head held high. Do you know what it feels like to be ashamed? Uh, I, I certainly do. Uh, I've been with my wife for 25 years. She'll give you a list. And these are things, you, you, there are things in our lives that we can't take back, that we can't undo. Only he can do that. And one day he will. And he will enable us to walk with our heads held high. To see him as he is. And for us to see each other as we are made in the image of God. And, and where we will enjoy creation as it was meant to be. In, it, somehow unbreakable. Just wonderful. And this is the message at the heart of the book of Leviticus. And the book of Leviticus is at the heart of the five books of Moses. That somehow, and you would never be able to work out this. It's like doing a, a thousand, a thousand, like to, it would be like trying to do a thousand piece jigsaw of clouds without the picture. <laughs> if you didn't have Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Like we've got to, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing to look at all these different prophecies and everything else, but without the picture, oh my gosh, you're going to be in big trouble. That's maybe I made it too complicated with the clouds. Let's have trooping of the color. You know, big jigs, thousand piece jigsaw, trooping of the color. Let's imagine that's all the prophecies about Jesus in the, in the old Testament, direct and in, in, indirect. You would never be able to put that, It'd be just like Humpty Dumpty. You'd never be able to put that jigsaw back together without the picture. But because we've got this perfect priest who has given us a perfect picture of what it means to be perfect. We can see how all these different sort of strings on the guitar of Leviticus play the tune of the gospel. And I think that's really exciting. And maybe just one last thing before we stop. Um, the book of Leviticus is called um, 
Leviticus in the, in your Bibles. In the in the synagogue, it's called the Book of uh, um, it's called Vayikra. Vayikra in Hebrew means uh, uh, the Lord called, and you can see those are the first three words of the English Bible. The book of uh, the book of Leviticus is about the Lord calling his people back into relationship with him by, with, by a perfect sacrifice of a male. Because if you skip back to the end of Exodus, you'll see that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and the cloud had settled on it and the glory filled the tabernacle. And it was so kind of, there's so much uh, glory there that Moses kind of couldn't get in. He had to run away. And then he was called back. And that's this back to this idea of that there's a seam there that points us even uses this the word vaikra, which is exactly the word, uh, the verb rather, that is used in Genesis when the Lord called in Lord called in Genesis three to his then people, Adam and Eve, where are you? Our God is always calling out, always holding his hands out to an obstinate, difficult, awkward bunch. And those are just the saved Christians, the born again one. But he's just calling out to humanity because he doesn't want any to perish, but all to turn to repentance and faith. So I hope that was really helpful. I hope that was useful. Um, uh, I didn't get to show you like 1 Peter 2, 9, the Holy Priesthood, which shows us how we are to be in this, why this is such an important book, um, or even the back half of 2 Peter, uh, where you again will see Peter using uh, the language of Leviticus and the language of new creation and the language of Genesis all together. Um, and we, uh, yeah, there's so much more but I have a problem stopping, so I better do that and give you a chance to ask me some questions. Oliver, do you want to unmute? Oh, I'll make it possible. Let's make it possible for you to unmute yourself, and then. Uh, 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 uh. Unmute yourself. Oh, you can unmute yourselves already. Jolly good. So, if you've got a question, just unmute yourself and ask me a question. Or ask Oliver a question. Even better. Did any, okay, let me ask you a question. Did any of that make any sense at any point? Yes. yes. Oh, brilliant. I'm a happy man. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I much appreciated the... Um, the warmth that comes through in what you t spoke about um, in Leviticus, because um, certainly it can be quite um, quite demanding to read it all in one go, and and uh, and and I, I really appreciated the relationship that you brought through out. You know that God loves us and that He's longing for us to to walk so closely with him so that obedience is great yeah. um i still i still uh, just want to ask you about um the sacrifice um yep. it just seems to be um it is one of the the dilemmas in our modern life <laughs> uh, that we're squeamish about this sort of thing and um it it does feel um to be such a major part of the of the life in, of the priest in the tabernacle. I, I don't know how they ever went to bed. They seem to be sacrificing <laughs> animals all the time. Always killing something. Always killing something. And um, and and so, um, you know, when I actually think about it, it must have been just the most horrendous career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when you think about what they actually did yeah. and how they, yeah. how they spent their time and, and their clothes must have just got so filthy and the tabernacle must have smelt like anything. I mean, Can all you of imagine? that. Stuff. Yes, on, I, on, on, the, on, the big, on the big cleaning day, Yom Kippur, they put even more blood everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried to clean something by wiping blood on it? I know. My oh, wife won't let me do that in the kitchen. I say to her, well, it's Yom Kippur, darling, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, it's, it, I suppose it's just the, the uh, rather modern day thinking about it. Um, but it is, it is just, it, it's such a contradiction, isn't it? I suppose that's, that's it. Yes, it mm. is. 
And I, I, in some ways to me, the gruesome bloodiness of the sacrifice mm. points to the gruesome, br gruesome bloodiness of Jesus's execution. Oh, yeah. Uh, man. Yeah. And and uh, Hebrews tells us that the, the the sacrificial system was made obsolete by um, uh, by the life, death, and resurrection by the coming of the perfect priest. Da, 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 da. Uh, and now Christians, Bible believing, born again, lovely Christians have argued about this whole business for, for centuries. We're not going to sort it out tonight, but. We're obviously not at a point where there is a priesthood or a temple or sacrifices. And and I'm I'm just grateful that I've got the book of Hebrews to give me comfort in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'm very comforted by, particularly by Mark 7. Uh, in Mark 7, you know, Jesus gives the Pharisees a right. So Jesus was a Pharisee. That's the best way to describe him. He was, a, he was the perfect Pharisee. Uh, the other guys taught the law but didn't do it and that was their big downfall in many ways but he there he, he takes the pharisees apart for putting ceremonial traditions and uh, corban over over the law and he says you you worship me with your lips but your hearts are far from me you can see as you look at leviticus that that the the, the the driving force of leviticus is the re-establishing of relationship yeah and I think that's just so delightful. Yeah. And then, then when G then Jesus moves on to basically uh, to, to explain to us that it's not what we eat that makes us unclean, but it's what comes out of us, what is inside of us that makes us unclean. Mm -hmm. And then Mark does a very like Mark is the brief, short, doesn't like to. He's like the opposite of me. Like likes to try and get everything done really fast. Chung 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 chung. But and very rarely does he insert any kind of editorial comment. But there, that's where he inserts the editorial comment to say, and and by doing so, he made all food clean. And it's it's easy to overlook that, but that is by doing so, he's he's swept away a whole element of the of the of the of the law to do with what you eat and and how that impacts. And th that that's a scary subject for us to talk about on Zoom. It's a yeah. scary subject to talk about in a Bible study. It's even worse if someone asks you to preach on it. But it does, it does, it 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 does open up the it it its purpose. I think certainly was in order to destroy this division between Jew and Gentile. Um, and and you see that working out in the Council of Jerusalem. You see it working out in the Book of Galatians, where you've got kosher keeping Jews who uh, are then uh, hanging out with uh, Gentiles, all celebrating the same Messiah. We're all one in him. You know, there's no, there's no male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, poor. Everybody is one in Messiah. And then they get frightened because they think, oh, other people might misunderstand. And then, it will, and then Corinthians is dealing with all these issues as well. And I guess in a way, we're still dealing with them now, even though most of us don't keep kosher. Yep. So anything else that anybody wants to ask? Yeah, I liked. I just wanted to pick up Simon. You mentioned um, Jewish children. The first book that they're taught was Leviticus. I think I've got that right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just thought that was quite interesting. How is that maybe where the Holy Spirit is trying to direct His own people? Like you were saying, Leviticus is the heart of the Torah, and you went right to the heart of God's unconditional love. And maybe that's a good way for us to pray that when the children are reading this, that through them reading it and their parents listening to them and encouraging them that that veil or their eyes could be illuminated to thinking about the real messiah the real sacrifice yeah yeah thought that was really good I, I i coming back to that image of the you know thousand piece jigsaw with the trooping of yeah. the color i think unless you've got that the the you know unless you've got the box with the picture that's right and, and you know i always i always get a bit carried away when i'm doing these kind of things and think i'm going a bit too far and pushing the envelope a little bit um but I, that's really good it's it i get excited when i look at it and when i share the stuff that i see with you guys so yeah, forgive me. because like you were saying earlier most 
most Christians would often think Leviticus is just kind of throw away. We've kind of, we've done that. We don't yeah. need it anymore. But now you suddenly reveal something. You've kind of joined up the whole of the, the whole of scripture to the end times revelation 20 on 22. That's incredible. Yeah. And like you, like, unfortunately we didn't have six hours for me to talk. Otherwise um, I would have quizzed you on um, who do you think, who do you think makes mo which prophet uses uh, Leviticus the most? And I would have, and and yes, you would have been right, Maureen. Again, excellent. Thanks for uh, Maureen. She's quite the Bible student. Um, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is, is the guy that uses so he uses so much of, um, of Leviticus um, because because he's because he was a priest. Who, who was, you know, I feel so sorry for Ezekiel. The guy is born into the priesthood. He waits till he's 30. He's ready to get his gown and everything on back to go off to the slaughterhouse that we were talking about earlier, Cynthia. And then he gets dragged off to Babylon. And while he's there, the temple gets destroyed. And he's thinking, oh no, that's the end of my, that's not what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> and then he says, oh yeah, well now what you need to do is to get into street theater. You need to go to lie down and pretend to be Jerusalem and then have to make a little, and he's like, oh no, Rick, what? And he, you know, there's a, the hand of the Lord was on me and I was seri seriously grieved or something like that, he says. He wasn't a bit, he went, he went away in bitterness. I think that's what it says, I can't remember. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to ask something. Oh yes, today. go ahead, Miriam. Um, okay, so I got the Leviticus 26 down. Yeah. But what other references um, did you use? Because I'd like to write them down, please. Gosh, what are the references? Uh, so uh, let's do that. Uh, uh, one. So I'd say you go Leviticus 1 verse 1. The Lord called to Moses. And then, I, like I said, just as in Genesis 3.10, the Lord called to Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, the relationship had been broken by their inglorious behavior in the yes. between Exodus and Leviticus, it's actually the presence of God, his glory that has separated Moses from God. And, and Moses needs a way to get back to God so that God can uh, ex help him to lead his people. And then really I, I, I went in verse three to five, just underlining the the fact that it was a, a perfect male without defect. So was that Genesis? No, no, that's Leviticus. Th Leviticus 1, 3 to 5. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the rest, I mean, really, I, I stayed pretty much in there and then in, in, Leviticus, tw in, in Leviticus 26, yeah. And then in Genesis, um, in Ten. Genesis one, I I really, I mean, I was so in, I didn't really kind of quote it directly. Um, let's see. I was really like in creation in in Genesis one, sort of let's say from the beginning of the animals. You know, God blessed them, verse 122, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase. And then pinnacling in the creation of us, yeah. be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Then he's then I kind of, oh, why am I, I'm just starting teaching something else now. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> just, but then, then you, then, then you see that we are made in his image. But it isn't that we're it isn't that we're male or female that makes us in his image because the animals are very specifically male and female. There's something. Yes. It's not about gender. It's it's about it's it's, a, it's fascinatingly. It's it's about some the animals don't get married, but we do. Something about male and female together, being made in our image. Somehow, male and female together are a mirror of our trinitarian God. And that is a whole different conversation that we certainly can't start at five to eight. No. <laughs> Tomorrow's anyway, a work day for me, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any Thank more? you. My pleasure. Thank Any you. more questions?
or comments or I thoughts? Just add, add one little one. You talked about Ezekiel. Mm. I was listening to somebody talk about how there will be sacrifice in the millennium. In the mm. third, is that right? Well, I'm sure we'll know when we get there. <laughs> I thought we'd have a little look before. <laughs> um, here's the thing. That's, so, one of the reasons people avoid the book of Ezekiel um, is because more, there's been more punch-ups in the church car park <laughs> <laughs> over whether or not that is a real temple. I don't, I mean, you know, maybe your church is different than mine, but after the service, every, virtually every Sunday, there's a scuffle in the car park over is this temple going to be rebuilt? I can't physically rebuild it. Oh, you can. God could do anything. And then it just, you know, descends into chaos. So, uh, so the, the answer is I'm really not, I am, I, I'm, I am, I sort of, you know, I don't know. I think of, I think of those that I think if, if the sacrifices have com been completed, then, and, and are, as Hebrew says, you know, that we have this perfect sacrifice, perfect peace, blah, blah, blah. Then I don't see how a temple is going to function. Doesn't mean to say it won't be there. Just, I don't think maybe it won't will function as something different. Could be the, could be the, could be the exact thing that's there but i don't understand why the sacrificial system would restart if mm. there's no sin in the world mm. and you know if revelation is saying uh, that there was no temple because the god himself was there and if the purpose of the temple if the purpose of the tabernacle and the temple was always to bring god and his people and creation back into unity with each other if that's then been achieved then i'd have to say to myself well what's the purpose of the temple Mm -hmm. maybe they'd repurpose it maybe that's his throne will be on the top of it that's where he'll sit mm -hmm. no, no. Mm -hmm. um i have a question for ollie yes um okay. it's nothing to do with this evening's <laughs> i was wondering <laughs> what are you having for dinner i keep reading, I keep reading about um uh the virgin daughter of, it, of Israel, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem, and seems to be some sort of significance in that wording. Um, it's for, maybe for another time, or you can, um, you can point me for some literature that I can get some understanding of what it actually means when they say virgin daughter of Israel. So I know it's not for this evening. Mm. Uh, um, I just thought I'd ask that. The other thing is, um, when I read scripture, I seem to be, it seems to me that God wants relationship. That's, that's without question. And everything that God does seems to, to me, I may, be off the, I may be off the page here, but seems to me that he wants a bride for his son. Everything he does. The underlying reason for everything is he wants a bride for his son. Am, am I off the page here? <laughs> um, and, and, and that's all yeah, I... I can see where you're going yeah in in terms of he, everything that the lord is doing he's, he's restoring he, he wants to restore back to himself that mm -hmm. perfect relationship mm -hmm. so like simon touched on mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know he wants to re restore yeah. everything that includes us we're the bride aren't we yeah so i can certainly send you some information on, on that if you want to just Put your email and just privately message me. I'll just copy yeah. that so I can send, oh, look up for some right. things. All right, Ollie. Thank you. Thank you very much. That'd be good. And um, I don't know if anyone has any more questions, but um, we will be able to um, get the recording of tonight available. Mm -hmm. um, I have to speak to Fiona. I'm not sure what she's been doing with them, but I believe they're going to be posted up. Um, so we can certainly catch up on the recording. And obviously in your own time, you can pause it and make notes and go back and rewatch sections. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I might see if Simon, if you were able to uh, take a photograph of the notes there that you wrote on the board um, or type them up or something so that we can also have a look at those and some, okay. see if there's some way we can get those made available. That would be good. Um, mm. and, and also, um, don't forget as well that um, as uh, missionaries for Chosen People Ministries, um, we're supported by people like you who give generously and who pray for us mm -hmm. and encourage us. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so if if you'd like to make a donation tonight, that would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, there are details on the Chosen People Ministries UK website there for mm -hmm. how to uh, designate a gift to um, to one mm -hmm. of us or to, to the general ministry, which we greatly appreciate. On you know, we live by faith. We trust the Lord to meet our income, to support mm -hmm. us and our families as mm -hmm. we're reaching out in this <coughs> exciting way with the gospel <coughs> to Jewish yeah. people and indeed Thank encouraging you. the body of Messiah to do the same mm -hmm. thing. So do have a look at the website, catch up with some news, mm -hmm. request our um, prayer letters and uh, the glossy newsletter, which comes every uh, every other month with some information there. So um, that's the Chosen People Ministries website for more info. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but I think, mm -hmm. is, is that everything, Simon? Did you wanted to add anything else? tonight it's been great to see you all so thanks all for coming no uh, just thank you so much for uh coming uh if you do have any questions then you can always email me or oliver you can email the office call the office um it, it's you know whenever i hear of a jewish person coming to faith it is there is always this there is always the there's it's almost never uh, a, a story about a Jewish missionary. It's always almost a story about a Jewish person who had a Gentile friend who uh, loved them, understood the Bible, and was able to teach the Bible to them in a way that they could understand. Yeah. And, you know, that's yeah, one yeah. of the things that's driving me doing this this evening mm -hmm. is, is because you guys, if you don't have Jewish friends, you can pray for people that do. You, you know, you can pray for, uh, you can, you can pray for, I could, I'm going to ask you to pray for, uh, um, just, you know, I got a, I, I bought my tiles from my house from a guy in Stamford Hill and I've got a problem. Uh, I've got a problem with the tiles and I've got to ring him tomorrow and I'm going to tell him while I'm talking to him that I was teaching on Leviticus and you can pray that we have a good conversation about Leviticus tomorrow. I, don't care. I couldn't care less about the tiles, truth be told, but I'd much rather have a conversation with him about Leviticus. Um, you know, and some of you might have all sorts of Jewish friends. I know some of you do. Um, just, you know, trust in God's perfect plan and just just keep just keep being a holy nation. Just keep reading your Bibles, keep asking him to fill you with his Holy Spirit and keep this great goal of a world without end. Uh, that he's promised for us and that he's paid for. He's wiped us clean. He's ransomed us and he's covered our sin. And that's the only way for us to ever to enter into this world without end. Would you like to ask a question? Go on then, Elizabeth. Hi. You. Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you think about the time coming when the veil will be lifted? Do you have any comment on that? Because it do you think like it it's like it doesn't go in at the moment? But like what do you think about the veil? You know, what would you have anything to say about that comment? Yeah. Um well I I want to say that Romans 9 to 11 teaches us that uh, their hearts are they covered until the full number of the Gentiles mm. comes in. Mm. Uh, so, which, I mean, that's it's it's all, that always strikes me. Whenever I think about that, I think of you know a man who takes two his son and his best his son's best friend on a boat, and the boat the huge wave hits the boat, and the two boys are in the water, and the dad pulls the friend out first knowing that the son will die. And I just, there's something remarkable about, he chooses, he chooses, he chooses a people for himself. And then he, 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 it's, it's it, he, he's, he's, it's only, it's only he who can open these blind eyes. It's only he who can open, oh, who can turn stony hearts to flesh uh, that can make the lame walk. Uh, it, I think that's, I th that's, I don't, there are things Deuteronomy teaches us that we don't understand and Isaiah, his ways are not our ways. 
uh, no thoughts are not our thoughts as high as from the, you know, I honestly, as I wish I knew, I, we're always, aren't we always eagerly waiting for them to look upon him who they have pierced mm -hmm. and mourn yeah. for him like yeah. they, you know, yeah. we desperately want to see this all Israel. We want to finally squash this idea that, that, that all Israel being saved is anything other than all Israel being saved. Yeah. Um, Instead of people fussing around saying, well, you know, it's, it's symbolic of the... <laughs> oh, just... I, I, sorry. I was listening to um, a synagogue reading about two months ago. Yeah. About Isaiah was sent, you know, here am I, send me. And he was sent to say, they're going to hear and, and hear not. They're going to have ears and hear not and eyes and see not. And then Yeshua repeats that in the gospels yeah but what i never saw before was it says until until this happens so like it really shocked me that there's an end coming to that there will be a day when yeah. that until will be there mm. I, I i if, if i was a televangelist of ill repute i would i could probably use this as a way to encourage you to give more <laughs> I smile and you be by But I, I, I don't know that's going to. I'm not sure Mitch Glazer, please. Elizabeth, wherever you are. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, this is the, you know, that Jesus repeatedly tells parables about us not knowing the time. Yeah. And then he tells us, then he says things like, can't you see that the time? <laughs> and, you know, if, if, if a, you could never get burgled, if you knew when the thief was coming, you, you know, you, you, the parable of the virgins and the oil. I mean, he tells so many stories. He keeps us in this tension, this mm -hmm. he keeps us in that tension, doesn't he? But I, I am fairly sure that he, he would like us to try and live as if he, as if he was about to come day mm. by day. Yeah. Us day, our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we oh, forgive those yes. who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. Mm. If, if, if people talk about, you know, keeping short accounts with God and blah, 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 but I just think it, it, is, it is helpful to think that it, to, to, to remind ourselves that he would, could come at any moment. Mm. But but then again, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, and none of us are going to live a thousand years. Well, not this side of death, anyway. So he always just, I love him, he's so funny. Like, just, he won't play. He, you try and paint him into a corner, and he says, oh, shall I draw a circle? <laughs> and you say, oh, how can I paint you into a corner now? There are no corners. <laughs> Great. Well, it's ten past eight. Um, I'm happy to stay for a few more moments, but there's obviously people feel guilty about being the first to leave. Maybe I should remove Oliver, and then that will start an avalanche of people going. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Any more questions? Thanks for a great study. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure, Mary. Maureen. Maureen, where? Thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah. Maureen. Oh, you've yeah. moved. Thank you. You, you were, you, you've gone. Oh, everyone's moving around. It's just people leaving. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can I? Can I only told you see. Would anybody like to pray for us just before we go? Wave uh, your hand if you would. Right. Uh, oh, right. Catherine, don't Father, God, do it. If he, if he can wave his own hand. I saw <laughs> Catherine lift up his her husband's hand, start waving it as if he was saying, "Yeah, he wasn't Catherine." But he okay, can I'll, do. I'll, I'll pray, so Go on, since she's bullied you into okay. this. <laughs> yes, Father, we do thank you for this evening. Thank you, we thank you for uh, the book of Le Leviticus, and we do confess, Father, that it's not one that we immediately would be drawn to. Um, out of our favourites in the books of the Bible, but we do thank you for the way that we've been able to look at it tonight and uh, to see you in it, Lord. We just thank you. We thank you that uh, 
as we uh, read particularly chapter 26. We just thank you for that thought that it was fulfilled in you, Lord Jesus, walking amongst us. And so we just thank you, Father, for all that you've given to us uh, through Leviticus. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to absorb it more, to draw us to it for our own self-study, that we might grow more into the likeness of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Oliver. Hilda, are you unable to leave? I, 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 if I throw you out, don't be offended. I was trying to just do the same, but not I to... I can put not... her in the waiting room. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> that's it. I think that's better. Put her in the waiting room. Then they... Ah, oh. well done. Very good. Oh, you can see the thing. So they'll just gradually leave, I suppose, won't they? Did you restart the recording again or not? Oh, I didn't even stop it. <laughs>